Ayub Tabe and the other leaders of the Anglophone struggle detained in Cameroon's political capital Yaoundé express deep anger against the court's refusal for them to greet persons who were at the Yaoundé military court today during the hearing of that case between the detainees and the state of Cameroon in connection to the deepening Anglophone crisis. The refusal of the court provoked an incident today in the Yaoundé military court and the case was adjourned to March 29, 2019 and the Deputy Secretary of State of the United States of America in charge of African affairs condemns the failure of President Paul B.S. government to solve the deepening Anglophone crisis. He has also called on the government to liberate Professor Maurice Camto, President of the CRM political party and the other leaders and supporters of that political party. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on this edition of the news on Equinox Television, live from my headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. I am Bablet Jonathan. We begin with news concerning the detained Anglophone uh, leaders, Sisiku, Ayuk, Tabe, and nine others who were arrested in the Federal Republic of Nigeria and brought back into the country and are being tried in connection to charges, in connection to charges linked to the Anglophone a crisis and of course the hearing today took another twist when the court refused that the detainees should meet with persons who had come from Anglophone Cameroon including the national chairman of the Social Democratic Front John Fundi and Sisiku Ayuk Tabe burst in anger and expressed himself notably with regards to the rejection and at the end of the day the court allowed them to meet with the uh, family members and of course other persons notably the national chairman of the social democratic front who was present at the Yaoundé military court today and the case was adjourned to the 29th of March 2019 because the Yaoundé military court George Mem Michel has been transferred to the southwest uh, regional capital uh, Boya military court and he's yet to be replaced. Take a listen Take a look at this scene. <laughs> And the American Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs has issued a statement notably highlighting the failure of the BIA government to solve the Anglophone crisis. He indicates that there are positive steps that can be taken to solve the deepening socio-political and security crisis in the two Anglophone regions of the Republic of Cameroon. And he equally indicated that it would be wise for President Paul Bia his government to free Professor Maurice Campbell, national president of the Cameroon Renaissance Movement, as well as other leaders and over 200 militants who have been detained in different incarceration centers in the nation's political capital, Yaoundé. Ino Senazi has more. In a wide-ranging interview with Radio France International, the American Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Sibon Nagy, emphasizes that governments of Cameroon needs to address the Anglophone crisis, which is close to three years old today, with daily bloody clashes between security forces and armed separatists. There is a very serious national crisis going on, but I believe the government needs to be more serious in how they address it. I'm not sure, and I hope I'm wrong that the government realizes just what a serious problem it is. Even though there have been some policies announced by government, in my view, they have been more symbolic than active. 
Donald Trump's Africa policy chief, Tibor Nagy, recalls that the United States in February 2019 cut some military assistance to Cameroon over concerns about human rights violations allegedly committed by the Cameroonian military. I think it could be settled relatively quickly. A couple of positive steps could be if the people in the northwest and southwest regions could directly elect their governors. The American diplomat referring to regional governors who are francophones said it will be unlikely that officials would be French speakers if anglophones had more say over their own governance. Tibor Nagy also suggested that the security forces operating in the Anglophone regions need to speak English. Still, to Tibor Nagy, a conference bringing together all sides involved in the crisis would be very positive. This, he added, would need to be endorsed by the highest levels of government. Reacting on the current political tension in Cameroon, the American Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs reiterated in strong terms government should release Professor Maurice Kanto and supporters of the CRM political party arrested and detained January 26. Despite the reason of their imprisonment in a comment, Tibor Nagy, the U.S. official, states, the government of Cameroon assures that Maurice Camto was arrested and imprisoned for legitimate reasons. I sincerely think it will be wise to free him because, be it true or false, he is seen as having been incarcerated for his political activism and this is unacceptable. While the government delays to free the opposition politicians and their supporters and to quickly resolve the Anglophone crisis, the Donald Trump's Africa policy chief prepares to arrive Cameroon next week. The Special Criminal Court in Yaoundé continues questioning the former minister delegate at the presidency of the republic of cameroon in charge of defense the former minister of transport edgar aleme bengo over alleged corruption and embezzlement charges committed during his tenure of office at the ministry of defense and the former member of government is being questioned and of course in the report coming up next manjikan gebre presents the profile of the former member of the Cameroon government. Home in San Milima, Edgar Allen Mebengo began working for the government way back in 1985 when he served as the economic affairs advisor the East Province between 1985 to 1988 and Secretary General of the North Province in 1988 to 1991. Subsequently, he was Senior Divisional Officer for the Ocean, Mefu Anafamba, and Fundi divisions respectively before his appointment on December 7, 1997 as Director of Civil Cabinet at the Presidency where he worked for seven years before his appointment as Delegate General of National Security on December 4, 2004. As Delegate General for National Security, Mebengo was credited with the crackdown on police abuses and reviving the police force of Cameroon. After four and a half years as head of the police, Bia moved Mebengo to the post of the Minister Delegate at the Presidency in charge of defense on June 30, 2009. Mebengo was retained in his post of government named on December 9, 2011, in the week of Bia's re-election for another theme. October 2, 2015, Mebengo was moved to the post of the Minister of Transport until March 2, 2008, when he was finally evicted from the government and later asked not to leave the country over allegations of corruption and embezzlement. 
the national chairman of the Social Democratic Front SDF political party, John Fundy, calls on women, notably those in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, hit by socio political and security crisis for close to three years today, not to celebrate the 2019 edition of the International Women's Day, but rather to use the day to uh, weep and mourn over the continuous killings, abductions, destruction of properties, burning down of houses and villages, and of course the situation of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of persons who have been displaced by the Anglophone crisis both internally and externally, living in precarious conditions in parts of the littoral, the west center and other parts of the country, and of course those who are in neighboring Nigeria. He spoke to Stella in Bamenda. Take a listen. I want to call on the Cameroonian women and the North and Southwest women who came out in their numbers and mourned at the Bongo Square in Boya. They sat down on their Botox and they wept of what was going through. Here at the stadium, here, Bamenda women went there and wept. And that, instead of celebrating this day, let the women sit down and weep and mourn for their husbands, for their children who are being shot and killed. Whether these tears will replace the blood that is flowing and Sabia will listen. It's unfortunate for us that in modern times this is what we are going through. John Fruit, the national chairman of the Social Democratic Front, speaking there to a Northwest correspondent, Mbu Stella. And in the Southwest region of the country, a correspondent, Derek Jato, talked to the regional delegate of women's empowerment and the family for the Southwest region, of course. And she told Derek Jato that the women in that part of the country, for those who are going to be celebrating, will be doing so with a heavy heart as a result of the deepening anglophone crisis and the devastating and deadly consequences of that situation in the southwest region of the country. Derek Jat also paints the picture of the town of Boya with hours to the celebration of the 34th edition of the International Women's Day. Derek Jato. It is Wednesday the 6th day of March 2019. Ash Wednesday which is the seventh Wednesday before Easter on Christian calendar. This same Wednesday is 48 hours to 2019 Women's Day celebration. And the organization is the responsibility of the regional delegation of women empowerment and the family. And at the Southwest Regional Office, the registration to participate is still open. Madam Judith Mofa, the Southwest Regional Delegate of Women Empowerment and the Family also revealed some activities that her office has been able to organize in prelude. We have just finished with the World Day of Prayer. We equally had a, a mini marathon race by the Basingi Women in Boya Town. And uh, there are so many activities going on. Uh, during this week-long activities and uh, we are going to converge on the 8th for uh, to finalize the celebration the Boya council too has contributed its own quarter for this year the council has prepared as it used to do uh, the mayor has bought the fabric for all the women who came here and look for it the fabric were given to them uh, in addition to that, the council was charged with the logistic. But their hearts are heavy. But my heart is really heavy. And I know that even the women who are going to come out, we are coming out with a heavy heart. Those who are living in the bushes, they can't have food to eat and all of that. I know it's very, very demoralizing. And uh, we are just praying that this uh, situation in our country should be brought to an end. Reason why even on the street of Boya, it is a near impossibility to have someone talk, especially a woman, on how she is gearing up ahead of their day. 
and all accusing fingers are pointing at the anglophone crisis which they say is taking everything from them the creepy deep sea port is yet to function in full capacity after almost a year of existence and authorities of the port have embarked on a mission to convince business um, persons to do trade through that maritime transport amenity. For me, I'm Strong Sander Hasmo. Barely over a year after its official inauguration, the Kriwi Deep Sea Port is still operating at less than 100%. Authorities of the port say 2018 was an experimental year and 2019 is time to amplify success. I would not say that the, 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 the Kriwi Port functions 100%. This could, could be a lie. But what I can say is that uh, since uh, almost one year, this functioning is upgrading day by day and we are doing everything to improve the, the competitiveness of this port. Within the backdrop of this ambitious drive, the general manager of the Kribi Deep Sea Port embarked on an information, sensitization and lobbying mission at the group of private sector organization, Jikam and Dwala. Economic operators cannot just run to Kribi without this information. I think it's, more, it's important for us to come and meet them and tell them that Kribi is already functioning and tell, and tell them also about the opportunities the Kribi port can give to them. For me it's important. I, I feel the, the, the first objective of Kribi is to take call it the overload of Douala port. The authorities also align that the Kribi deep sea port offers, among other advantages, competitive tariff plans, import period of two to three days, and export within five to six days. The Kribi Deep Sea Port authorities say offer a vast industrial zone with a vast transport network under construction. The port of Kribi, within a few months of existence, has recorded 250,000 tons of wood on export and 12,000 tons of goods on imports. Authorities of the Kribi Deep Sea Port hope to amplify success after knocking at the doors of Jikam. The Kribi Deep Sea Port is looking forward to sign an agreement with the Cameroon Employers Union, better known by its French acronym, GCAM, in view of encouraging business persons to do a business in that maritime transport amenity so that it can get into full capacity functioning. It has been existing for close to one year today. And that's it for the first part of this newscast. Coming up next, Talking Point. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us in Talking Points. We are receiving a university lecturer and a gender expert, Dr. Vivian Komenek Mucha. You're a lecturer at the University of Douala. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan, and thank you for inviting me to be your guest for the evening. You're lecturing uh, gender issues at the University of Douala, is that? Uh, yes, yes, I'm a lecturer the University of Douala and I specialize in gender uh, activities and everything that has centers around the woman right. as well as literature. Okay, there is um, a debate today concerning the celebration of the 34th edition of the International Women's Day in Cameroon. Some women are saying no, we're not going to celebrate, we're not going to buy fabric. Some are saying no, staying back, not celebrating will not solve any problem. We need to commemorate and press for our rights to be respected. Uh, what's your take on that? Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Jonathan. Uh, uh, looking at this whole issue of the Women's Day celebration, I want to believe that it is a matter of choice because when we look at the woman, especially around the globe, women have been scouting for their rights from time immemorial. But as of now, where we are, and looking at the position of many women, we understand that the each and every woman is, many women are still to understand what this whole issue of Women's Day celebration is about. Because 
some go out the scouting for the, the women's day fabric, whereas they don't even know what is inscribed on the fabric. They don't understand some of the messages on the fabric. So I want to say that if women must go out there scouting for their rights, they should first of all be educated. What are these rights? They should be educated, they should know the rights before they go out scouting for the Women's Day fabric. Because this whole issue of the Women's Day fabric is actually bringing problems into so many homes. But when you call up a woman and ask, why are you struggling to get a fabric? Can you even read what is inscribed? Can you explain of what benefit is it to you? So I believe we should start by educating the women, making them to understand the raison d'etre of this uh, Women's Day celebration and some of the me messages that the fabric carries. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I believe the women will understand why they should be celebrating the Women's Day. Maybe we should start by edifying them on what is written on the fabric this year and the theme and so on. On the fabric this year, um, we have uh, uh, writings like education for all, gender equality, and all of that. I may not uh, name all of them. But those are some of the inscriptions on the fabric for, for, for this year. All right. And while you'll be celebrating, certainly uh, the, there are many women in the Northwest and Southwest who will not be celebrating because of the situation there. Uh, they, are, they, they are into suffering and their situation is very difficult. Well, Mr. Jonathan, it's really a pathetic situation. But uh, we are in a society and like all other societies, these problems, this crisis that happen in other societies. So I know it is really a, such a, a, a terrible thing to, 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 to bear, but I would like to call on these women to understand that where there is a dark cloud, certainly there is a silver lining. They should not give up. It is true. They are suffering. But at the same time, they should understand that it is not going to be forever. The suffering is not going to be forever. And moreover, I want to call on these women to understand that where there is suffering, you should try to make something positive out of it. It is not easy, I understand. But I, because I know after the crisis and all of that, uh, some women will, will, will have moved to one step, from one step to another. What am I saying here? Because, because of the crisis, they have been forced to get into certain things that will make them, help them to maybe support their families, whereas initially, they were, some of them were depending on their husbands. But because of the crisis, they've come to understand that the need to struggle, the need to, 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 to become those breadwinners for their families, so that at the end of the day, even if the man is not there, they should still be able to support the family and to make the family move on without any problem. All right, that is uh, extracting uh, a drop of um, water from an ocean of, I don't know, acid. Let me it put it that way. If we can put it that way. All right, now let's talk about inequality. In Cameroon today, there is still a wide gap between men and women uh, who are holding top positions of responsibility, leadership positions. Ministers, there are very few of them. Uh, senior division officers, just about two. Uh, and of course, we have uh, division officers also, just uh, about 50 out of 360 and so on. And then at the level of the Senate, at the level of the, 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 the lower house of parliament, it's equally the same thing. The gap is very wide. What accounts for this inequality? Oh, that is a very pertinent question there, Mr. Jonathan. I would like to say that uh, we have to understand that from time immemorial, our society has always been a patriarchal society. And what do I mean here? Being a patriarchal society, we understand the men have always been striving to suppress the women. And it, it is not surprising that today we find in top position that would have been occupied by women as well. Only women, only men topping these top positions. It is very simple. We are in a patriarchal and a chauvinistic society, and the man will always want to be up there. But that notwithstanding, I would like to point out here that at least there are women occupying important positions in the government today. Is it only it's a problem of the men oppressing the men? Is it only the problem because that is more linked to culture uh, where some cultures do not actually promote 
women to the forefront uh, and so on. Is it only a problem of the men, the women too? The, do they not have a, uh, yes, a part yes, to play in the, in the situation? Yes, uh, uh, that is very good there. Because when we look at the whole issue, we understand that the women themselves, they have a very big role to play because the society, it is said that uh, the woman is the woman's enemy or even worse enemy, which implies that even when some of these women occupy these uh, important positions, how well do they encourage other women to join them? How well do they uh, uh, educate other women to join them? So it implies that the man and the woman, they are all you know, trying to suppress the, the, the female gender at some point, maybe. All right. Now, when we look at uh, the other day, I was talking with um, a, a gender crusader like you, and she was highlighting uh, this issue of uh, inequalities in, in terms of uh, payment, notably salaries and so on, and appointments to certain positions of responsibility in enterprises and, uh, and so on. Why, why is there these um, differences between men and women uh, who are occupying top positions, managers of enterprises, for example, at the level of salaries? Oh, at the level of salaries. But uh, Mr. Jonathan, I want to believe that looking at our society of today and looking at some of these positions we're talking about and the salaries, I want to believe that the, 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 the man and the woman, if they occupy the same positions, they are paid the same salary. I don't see any difference in terms of salary. I don't know, except in some organizations. But to the best of my knowledge, as a lecturer, I have the same salary with my male colleague. So I don't see uh, uh, any problem Maybe at that, that level. Maybe that is predominant at the level of uh, private institutions. Maybe non-governmental or, uh, organizations private, or private, private institutions. institutions. So it's not a government issue, to the best of my knowledge. All right. What should be done by government, by the women, to clear off this or, or to reduce this gap? Why not eradicate this gap between the men and the women? First and foremost, we are talking about a gap. The women have to sit up. They have to make their presence felt. They have to educate younger women and bring them up to these positions that they will eventually occupy tomorrow. Because when we look at um, uh, the society of today, we understand that there are some women who occupy very important or big positions. But at the end of the day, you see they finally uh, retire or leave these positions without having other women to take over from them. It is true, we'll blame it on uh, the men and all of that, but I always ask this question, what are the women doing to foster the image of other women? That is where my position is. Women should try as much as possible to foster the image of other women and to put their hands together and work as women who have similar or share the same problems and should not work as individuals because I know working as a team will surely make the women to achieve better things in the future. All right, what's your take on the way Women's Day is celebrated in Cameroon? It's more of celebration, you know, eating, drinking, dancing, and sometimes going to the excesses and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that um, the, 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 the scenario in Cameroon is that which calls for a lot of education. We have to educate our women. Where in the past, women used to go, you know, that, that extra mile, they used to, what we call suleve, like, and all of that. But I think women have been educated up to a level where, uh, as of now, I don't see many women actually going out, except there are women who are very, very uncivilized, because civilized women should not go out you know, exposing their bodies for the sake of Women's Day celebration and all of that. So uh, I'm calling on women to be, uh, I mean, to, to be very conscious and to understand that this day is meant for reflection. We are reflecting on those things that center around women and that can help foster, you know, women and at the same time peace and development in the country instead of concentrating on things that uh, will rather paint a very negative image of the woman. Dr. Vivian Komonek Muchaf, thanks for coming. You are welcome, Mr. Jonathan. Dr. Vivian is a lecturer at the university.
of dual and a gender experts. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for today. Thank you.